Today is Quinquagesima Sunday. The second oration begins with the words Akuntis and invokes the intercession of the Blessed Mother and all the saints. The third oration begins with the word Fidelium and is a prayer for all of the souls of the faithful departed. For the Quinquagesima Sunday, the epistle is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 13. Brethren, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And if I should have prophecy and should know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I should have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And if I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity is patient, is kind, charity envieth not, dealeth not perversely, is not puffed up, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices with the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never falleth away. Whether prophecies shall be made void, or tongues shall cease, or knowledge shall be destroyed. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away the things of a child. We see now through a glass in a dark manner, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. And now there remain faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. Luke, chapter 18. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time Jesus took unto him the twelve, and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things shall be accomplished which were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. For he shall be delivered to the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and scourged, and spat upon, and after they have scourged him, they will put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this word was hidden from them, and they understood not the things that were said. Now it came to pass, when he drew nigh to Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And when he heard the multitude passing by, he asked what this meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy on me. And they that went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried out much more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus standing commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I do to thee? But he said, Lord, that I may see. And Jesus said to him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he saw, and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful You would not expect a two-year-old child to kneel straight and still for 15 decades of the rosary. That would be an unreasonable expectation. You would not expect, perhaps, a two-year-old to even kneel straight or tall for five decades of the rosary. It might even be difficult for a little one like that to kneel straight and still for one decade of the rosary. We would consider a two-year-old who could kneel straight and still for 15 decades of the rosary to be extremely extraordinary, saintly even, at that age. The reason why we would consider it to be remarkable is because 
When people are children, when we were all children, we didn't understand anything but the discomfort. That's all we knew. And so our parents didn't expect us or require us to do what was for us at that time virtually impossible. That would be cruel to expect a little child to do something that is beyond his powers at that age. And as we grow, we gradually get more and more control of ourselves and gradually more and more understanding. And so it might not be possible to expect a two-year-old to kneel straight and still for five decades of the rosary, but it is not expecting too much to want a 12-year-old to kneel straight and still for the rosary. But again, when we want the youngsters to know what they are doing and to appreciate what they're doing and to be able to control themselves enough to do it, you would not expect a two-year-old to sit through the entire Mass quietly, attentively. Why? Because the two-year-old needs to learn. You need to teach the two-year-old. You expect your 12-year-old to do so. You'd never expect your two-year-old to do so. Why? What have they learned in the meantime? Well, among the other things they've learned, not only is self-control, but they've learned the reason for things. Now they understand be better than they did. How much does a two-year-old understand about the rosary or the mass? Not much. A Twelve-year-old, though, it makes a difference. Those ten years should make all the difference. And now the twelve-year-old is beginning to understand something beginning to understand what he couldn't understand at the age of two. The 12-year-old should be learning what love is. That's, that should be the biggest difference. The 12-year-old is learning the meaning of love. From whom? From his parents, from her parents. He or she is learning the meaning of love. From the parents' love for the child, the child learns what love means. It is from the parents' love for the child, the child first begins to learn what he or she must later do, and that is return that love and begin to love for love, and eventually learn the meaning of love. We're not born with this knowledge. It's something that we have to learn. But there are different kinds of love, as we know. We use the word love in English for all of them, but that's not really fair. It's not really right or logical to do so because there are some significant differences among the different kinds of love. The love that St. Paul talks about here in the epistle is he agape in Greek. He agape is a kind of spiritual or selfless love. Now we call selfless love the love which makes us want to give of ourselves for the good and the happiness of another person. That's called in Latin the amor benevolentiae, the love of well-wishing, the love of a parent for a child is really the love of well-wishing. The parent sacrifice, sacrifices himself and herself for the little one. They love so much, even long before that little child can love them back. The parent is sacrificing so much for the little child out of great love. And the greatness of the love of the parent must be so great that it makes up for the lack of love coming from the child. The child hasn't learned to love. But then the child learns to love, and the child loves his parents. That's a different love from the love of the parent for the child. And then a child learns to love brothers and sisters. And again, the relationship is different there, so there's a unique love for that. The love of uh, one friend for another is a unique love. The Greeks gave it the name philia, to have a, a, a love of, uh, for a friend that is unique, that appreciates the friend, but still has the love of well-wishing, so that one friend will give of himself or herself for the benefit of the other and sacrifice himself for the happiness of the other, to assist and help the other. Well, of course, there is a, an altogether unique love, in a sense, that altogether unique 
because it requires something extra special of the love for a spouse. You would love your spouse in a unique way, a way not only that you wouldn't love anyone else, but you're forbidden to love anyone else. You must have that love only for your spouse, the one you're, you marry. And that is true love. It has in common all the other things that love has, whether it be for parents and brothers and sisters and friends, but it has something over and above that that is unique to that love of a spouse. That uh, love can be on the level of the of the physical. It's called eros in Greek. But there must be much more than that to make it true love of a husband for a wife and a wife for a husband. There must be every kind of love. In other words, that love that a husband and a wife have for, have for each other actually should include the elements of all the other kinds of love brought together and then more so, and more so, something special. And so we see these different kinds of love, and everyone has to learn the meaning of these kinds of love as they, each one of us goes through life. Now, St. Paul <clears throat> tells us what characterizes true love. He maps it out for us, and in mapping out the characteristics of true love, he maps out for us our agenda for Lent. And that's why the Church gives us this epistle, because St. Paul is actually actually setting for us the, the agenda that we should follow, the program we should follow for Lent. <clears throat> because it is a matter of growing up. <coughs> you would not expect your two-year-olds to understand the reason for coming to Mass. You would want your 12-year-old to begin to understand this, You'd want your teenagers to have a greater understanding of it. There are those who say, well, when we're infants, <clears throat> our parents have faith that we're going to grow up. When we're adolescents, they hope we will grow up. And when we finally grow up, then they can actually love us for who we really are because we've come to maturity and adulthood. <clears throat> you would not expect an infant to understand why we go to mass. You wouldn't mind if a three-year-old or four-year-old asked you, Mommy, Daddy, why are we going to mass? Because you would explain to them why. You certainly wouldn't want your 13 or 14 or 15-year-old to be asking, why do we have to go to mass? Because that would tell you they still don't understand. They still do not understand. It's a matter of love. It's a matter of love. If they don't understand that, or begin to understand that by the time they're 12 or 13, something is missing that should be there, an understanding, the beginning at least of an understanding of love, of what love is, and how it applies to the Mass. Because the greatest love that we can have is in response to the greatest love we can receive, and that is the love of God. And if there is a love of God, if there's any love of God there, it should draw from us the beginnings of love for Him. And only then can we understand why the Mass. Not only why we are here, but above all, why He is here. It is love. It is all love. It is all about love. Now, when we talk about the love for God, we realize especially that this is something we learn. We learn our faith, we learn to hope, and we learn to love. We learn to love our parents, we learn to love our brothers and sisters, we learn to love our friends, we learn to love our spouses, we learn to love our own children, but we have to learn to love God. And uh, some of us learn and some don't. And there's a line that divides those who do and those who don't. It's very obvious in the sense that when you talk about the love for God that should be there, if it's not there, the person is completely unmoved, untouched, actually even puzzled, perhaps even 
becomes angry and fearful. As though it's a threat to say you really should love God. Because it imposes, love always imposes some burdens on a person to make sacrifices for the one who's loved. And if they're called upon to sacrifice for one they don't love, that seems like an intolerable burden. Seems like it's asking way too much. And so you see by the reaction of people, when you talk about love for God, there are those who have like an understanding in their eyes. They understand immediately what you mean because they, they have a love for God. It may not be perfect, it may be far from perfect, but it's real and it's there, it's within them. And they know what that means to love God. <clears throat> and so when you're talking to them, you're talking to them with understanding. They understand what you're talking about. But for one who does not have a love for God, they are completely in the dark. You see, there's absolutely no understanding that reflects on their face and their eyes because there's nothing in their heart. They don't know what you're talking about. They can't even begin to understand. They're like the blind who's never seen when you're describing something visible. Or the deaf who've never heard when you're describing something audible. Because like the blind man in the gospel today, all he can do is cry out, Lord, Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And someone in that condition who still has not learned to love and has learned no love for God, that is what they have to do. They have to ask, Lord, please create in me a new heart. Give me that love, the grace to know your love for me, and that I may respond by loving you in return. It's a matter of prayer. For those who have some love for God, even very imperfect love, they want to love God more. Love wants to love. Love enjoys love. Love delights in love and rejoices in love. Love rejoices in making sacrifices. When someone loves another, he or she loves to go out of his or her way to do things, to give up oneself to the beloved. That's the nature of love. They want to give. And in giving love and in giving of oneself out of love, one feels that they've gained more than they've given. The one that, who receives the love of another receives a great deal, but the one who loves feels that he is the one or she is the one who has received the greatest thing. It's almost a privilege to love another person whom you admire so much and find so so beautiful inside and out in character and that is what matters that there be a goodness there that draws our love so the beloved gains but the lover the one who loves gains the most by loving that's how we feel and so it is with one who loves God now we know that God loves us indeed we hear that all the time but, you know, it's hard for us to fathom the love for God. In fact, it's impossible to fathom the love for God because His love is the, the love of a will that is infinitely powerful. Uh, the, the love of God is, is everywhere. It sustains everything in existence. Everything, including ourselves. Every hair on our head, our Lord said, is numbered. And God's, he, in other words, he knows it individually and exists because he wills it into being and sustains it in existence. But not everywhere does God love us as man loves. When God became man, he took upon himself a human nature. He took upon himself a human intellect and human will. And he took upon himself the ability to love as a human loves. God has not only his divine love for us, but now by the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, he also has a human love for us. When our Lord spoke to his apostles, he spoke to them of God's love. But he himself had a real human love for his apostles. He knows what it is to love, not only as God, but as man loves. And so while God loves everywhere he is, and he is everywhere, in his knowledge, in his power, 
God loves as man in the Blessed Sacrament. His human love is present there. The love that brings him from heaven is present there in the Blessed Sacrament. That love is there and it is very real. The saints understand this. The saints know the meaning of these words. They know the presence of our Lord and his love for them in the Blessed Sacrament. They can feel it. In the Blessed Sacrament, we meet and we unite ourselves with the love of God in a most astonishing way. God is everywhere. His love is everywhere. But God is not everywhere as man. In the Blessed Sacrament, God is present as God and as man. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, made man, is present there in his divine person and in his humanity. In the Blessed Sacrament is the heart of Jesus Christ. In the Blessed Sacrament is present the divine love for us, but also there is present the human will and the human love of Jesus Christ for us. In the Gospel we find that human love of our Lord, expressed so tenderly, so beautifully, so powerfully, the saints knew that love when they were in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. They experienced it. They felt it. They even tasted, as they call it, the love of Jesus Christ for them. Both the love of the divine will of God and the love of the human will of Jesus Christ, they knew it was there. They felt it there. It was intensely real to them. It captivated their minds and hearts. It became the focal point of their entire lives. How urgently do the saints speak to us about this experience of the love of God that they knew in the Blessed Sacrament? They hope to enable us to see what they see, to enable the blind to see. They hope to enable us to hear what they hear, to enable the deaf to hear. They want us to feel what they felt, as it were, and to experience what they experienced of the love of God bursting from the host, radiating from the host, and not only with the love of God, but the love of Jesus Christ as man coming to us in Holy Communion. That is what they wanted us to see. That is what they wanted us to hear. That is what they wanted us to experience, what they knew of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ in that host, incarnate in the sacrament. One could have before his eyes the most magnificent sunset, something spectacularly beautiful. But how does he describe it to a blind man who has never seen colors or light or anything of the kind? How does a person hear a beautiful symphony that just captivates his mind and takes his, all of his attention? It is so beautiful. How does he explain what he's hearing to someone who's deaf and has never heard a sound? Well, this is how the saints feel about us, I'm afraid, sometimes. If the love for God is there within us, then the love of Christ himself in the host strikes a chord in our hearts and draws us to him, and we can begin to understand what we are receiving. But if the love of God is not there, if the soul is cold and dark and empty, lifeless, empty of love for God, it is completely blind to the powerful love, the amazing love that is present right here in the tabernacle, in the priest's fingers as he placed the host upon your tongue, totally insensitive and unaware. How tragic is that? 
But even the blind man today heard the crowd going by and asked, What is happening? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so even the blind can call out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And when our Lord calls him and says, What would you have me do for you? The answer remains the same. Lord, that I may see, that I may see. St. Paul says that when we're children, we speak as children, we understand as children, we think as children, but when we grow up, we put away the things of a child. We no longer think as a child, we no longer understand as a child, and we no longer speak as a child. But now we are mature. We're grown-ups. We become adults. Not only in body, in mind, and soul. Emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, we've grown up. We say that someone like that is spiritually mature. They've grown to maturity. But that means this. That means that their faith and their hope have matured in charity. It is charity that makes the soul mature. That is what makes the soul grown up. And that is what we must do this Lent. We have to grow up. St. Paul tells us how. He tells us the characteristics of charity in a person's life, in a person's speech, in a person's thinking, even. He thinks in a charitable way. Now there is genuine spiritual maturity. A person like that doesn't need to ask, why do we have to go to Mass? Because the person knows, understands what a four-year-old or a seven-year-old doesn't know. By the time your children are 17 years old, they should be able to explain to your seven-year-olds why we go to Mass. And they should understand the love that is here for them and how at the Mass love meets love and at the communion rail especially love meets love the divine and human love of our Lord Jesus Christ meets the love that we bring to him here at the communion rail that's a beautiful encounter when love meets love that's the legendary thing that we all find so inspiring and the human mind and heart revolves around that, love meeting love. Ultimately this, the love of God, our Creator and our Redeemer, even as man, loving us as man, meeting here the love that we have to bring Him. God grant that we have something to bring Him. And so I ask you to please dedicate your Lent to this purpose, to understanding, to growing up, to putting away the things of a child and to grow up, especially in charity. That is maturity, and that is what we all have to aspire to. So I ask you to turn to our Blessed Mother. Of all the creatures of God, Mary, the Blessed Mother, loved him with all her heart and all of her mind and all of her soul and all of her strength. She loved him not only as a saint's love, but she loved him as a mother loves, and that's something very special. She loved him as only a mother could love. How, how can a mother love God as a mother loves God? The Blessed Mother knows how to do that. It is her whole life. It's her whole existence in heaven right now. So just as the Blessed Mother, during her lifetime, would reach down and take the hand of Jesus and lead him and guide him, just as he would reach up to take her hand, so do you also. So should we all, this led, reach up, take her hand. She's extending it to us. She wants to be our guide through Lent because she understands what it is to love with a love, not of a, just a little child, which is very sweet, but it's very imperfect. And she wants us to be able to love with a mature, a grown-up love, the love that she has. She wants us to learn how to love like that. So she will teach us, but she has to take us by the hand and guide us. So I ask you to ask her to be your spiritual 
mentor during this Lenten season, to take the epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians here as your model, to not only pray it every day, we've given you the copies of it in your bulletins, but also to turn it, turn it over in your mind, to learn it by heart, but also to take it to heart and put it into practice. And then you know that you'll be putting away the things of a child and you'll be making progress spiritually and growing up spiritually, finally to maturity, the maturity of the saints. So we pray to our Blessed Mother, O oh Mary, please lead me, take me by the hand and lead me to thy son. Let me stand between thee and St. John, another great, great heart who knew what it was to love God and be loved by him, to stand between them there even on Calvary, to bring even there what love we have that we may know what it is to be loved so powerfully by God as God, but also to be loved so powerfully by God as man. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.